Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharon. I'll be presenting on biomarkers and sepsis. It's quite a broad topic, so I, I hope to cover the important points in the time allocated. Um, so it's ironic that I'm doing this talk in September because although it's past um, 13 September, has been um, uh, declared World Sepsis Day, and it's part of a UK-wide Sepsis Awareness Month in September. It was initially established in 2012 by the Global Sepsis Alliance and serves to um, promote global leadership to reduce the worldwide burden of sepsis. Um, the World Health Organization also endorses this, and um, they've been uh, promoting various ways in which infections can be prevented, both at a community level as well as a healthcare level. So before we talk about the, the bio, it's important to just go through the definitions and um, the basic pathophysiology of sepsis so we understand where and why the biomarkers are used. So um, I'm sure the audience is quite familiar with the sepsis 3 definition of uh, sepsis, which is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. So the pathobiology of sepsis involves organ dysfunction, which indicates a more complex pathobiology than just infection and an inflammatory response alone. So sepsis is not a specific illness, but rather a syndrome so uncertain pathobiology and is a multifaceted host response to an infecting pathogen that may be significantly amplified by endogenous factors. So how do we identify patients with sepsis? So to assess the severity of organ dysfunction, the SOFA score was developed. And the higher the SOFA score, the, the higher the probability of mortality. And a clinical model called the quick SOFA showed that any two of the three clinical variables offered a predictive validity similar to that of the full SOFA score outside of the ICU. So these scores prompt infection in patients not previously recognized as infected, prompts clinicians to further investigate for organ dysfunction, does not need laboratory tests as it's clinically based, can be assessed fairly quickly, and identifies adult patients with suspected infection who are likely to have poor outcomes. So this is taken from the sepsis 3 paper. And it's the algorithm used for scoring patients. And on the right, we can see the variables involved in the full SOFA score, which are both clinical and laboratory parameters. And the quick SOFA is just clinical criteria in the form of status and systolic blood pressure. So why is sepsis a big deal? So this is the global report on the epidemiology and burden of sepsis published by the World Health Organization in 2020. And we can see here just the percentage of all global deaths related to sepsis in each underlying cause category, in the form of infections related to non-communicable diseases and injuries is quite high. So in the setting of infection, the presence of organ dysfunction is associated with an in-hospital mortality rate of 10%. And according to the World Health Organization, based on a publication in The Lancet in 2017, there were 48.9 million cases of sepsis worldwide. 11 million sepsis related deaths worldwide and of all global deaths. 85% of sepsis cases and sepsis related deaths worldwide occurred low and middle income countries. And the most common causes of sepsis were diarrheal diseases followed by lower respiratory tract infections. So aside from the mortality, the morbidity associated with sepsis in, the form, in sepsis survivors shows that one third die within a year, one sixth experience significant morbidity such as functional limitations, and almost 40% are re-hospitalized within 90 days of discharge. The image here on the, on the right, which is the World Sepsis Day in highlighted there, where they've, they've uh, talked about mortality where 11 million people die. And that's one death every 2.8 seconds, which is quite a scary statistic. And aside from the morbidity and mortality associated with sepsis, sepsis is a major driver of broad spectrum antibiotic use and thereby contributes to the global threat of antimicrobial resistance. 2019 um, GLASS, which is this global antimicrobial resistance surveillance system, um, did a data call of 66 countries who submitted antimicrobial resistance data, and they showed a high rate of antibacteria that cause serious infections in both the community and the healthcare setting. And for example, this was taken um, from that uh, document showing that Klebsiella pneumoniae resistant to third generation Kephalosporins in bloodstream inf infections globally in 2018 were almost 80 to 100% in 12 countries. So who is at risk? 
basically anyone and everyone, but more especially older persons, pregnant or recently pregnant women, neonates, hospitalized patients, ICU patients, patients with HIV, liver cirrhosis, malignancy, renal disease, ACE clinic patients. So this is from the same report, and I just wanted to highlight that this refers to country level coverage of studies on sepsis incidence. And in Africa, we don't have any. And um, very little data on sepsis epidemiology are available from the scientific literature, especially in low middle income countries where the burden of sepsis seems to be higher. So the burden in South Africa, I managed to find on um, Stats South Africa, the percentage distribution of deaths by main groups between 2016 and 2018 and infectious Aesthetic diseases were number two on that list. So it is an ongoing problem for us as well. So next, I just wanted to give a very brief and simplistic overview of the pathophysiology of sepsis. And I've put this, this image here because they, in a slide or two, it actually describes the main um, mechanisms in sepsis leading to multi-organ failure as the four horsemen of the septic apocalypse. So this is just a very simplistic um, overview of the basic um, process that happens when you have irritation. So you have the microbe in the form of bacteria, fungi, viruses, or damaged cells, which are picked up by pathogen-associated molecular proteins or damage-associated molecular proteins and stimulate antigen-presenting cells. And these antigen-presenting cells then release a whole host of cytokines in the form of IL-1, beta, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, and other interferons, which have a whole host of effects on other organs of the body, the brain, the liver, um, which causes an increase in acute phase proteins in the form of renogen, amyloid, um, the stimulation of the bone marrow to produce white blood cells, um, and the stimulation of neuroendocrine cells to produce PCT, which we'll talk about a bit uh, later on. And so this is a very simplistic um, overview of, of what happens when you have an infectious or inflammatory stimuli that sets off this um, pattern of, of cytokine-mediated communication and effects on um, various organs of the body. So this was what I was referring to the septic apocalypse. And again, it's a very simplified version, but it's just to give us an idea of the important things that happen in, in the pathogenesis of sepsis leading to multi-organ failure. And it's namely one endothelial dysfunction, which causes capillary leakage and can lead to multi-organ failure. Coagulopathy, which can be in the form of DIC and um, blockage of microvasculature, which re results in reduced tissue perfusion, which subsequently leads to multi-organ failure. Cellular dysfunction, which leads to reduced cellular energy consumption by the cells and cardiovascular dysfunction in the form of left ventricular dilatation, hypertension, as a means of trying to maintain cardiac output in the setting of cytokines that, for example, reduce the systemic vascular resistance. And this all leads to multi-organ failure. So there's this concept about the golden hour. And I think various specialties, you know, um, say time is time is heart, time is brain, time is kidney. And the same applies to infections as well, where studies have shown that the initial assessment and monitoring approaches should be started within an hour as giving antibiotics early reduces mortality. And this approach is recommended in the sepsis six NICE guidelines and 2018 sepsis bundle. There's a reduction in mean survival by 7.6% for every hour treatment is delayed in the following six hours. And so the search for the idea problem, though, is that there have been over 200 biomarkers identified for this purpose. So this is a very busy slide, and it's just to give you an idea of the sepsis biomarkers that have been identified from the current literature and the number of studies that have been done on these various biomarkers. And I'm not going to go through all of them because they, they're quite a lot, but I'll, we'll focus on the important ones that have gained popularity over the last couple of years. So what is the ideal sepsis biomarker? So according to the NIH, a biomarker is a characteristic that can be objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of pathological processes and pharmacological responses to a therapeutic intervention. The ideal biomarker in sepsis would be one that's highly sensitive, highly specific, related to disease burden, changes in accordance with the clinical evolution, provides information about prognosis, is reproducible, is easy to do, and is cost-effective. So this is a brief history of sepsis biomarkers over the years. 
And I found this quite interesting because as early as 1843, lactate was discovered as an association in patients who had sepsis. 1927, white blood cells were, were, were discovered as an as part of uh, the SERS response in, in sepsis. 1982, CRP, 1989, IL-6, 1993, PCT. And so over the years, there have been a number of biomarkers that have been um, developed to try and, and, and assist in the diagnosis of, of sepsis. So biomarker kinetics are really important. And I just want the audience to, to keep this graph in mind because it, it is what is going to be the basis of the pros and cons of the various um, biomarkers that we'll speak about individually. And that the, the interleukins, for example, like IL-6 rise fairly quickly when there's an inflammatory stimulus. Um, within the one, first one to two hours, peaks at about two hours, and then um, the levels drop exponentially when the stimulus ends. PCT starts to rise within three to four hours, peaks at about 12 hours, um, 12 to 24 hours, and then rapidly um, the levels go down as the stimulus ends. Where CRP takes about three to four hours to start to rise, reaches a peak at about 36 hours, and then takes about 24 hours to 48 hours to go down to... So we'll start off with the white cell count. Um, so with infections, there is production of a number of cytokines, like we had um, seen in, that, in the first uh, diagram that illustrated the pathophysiology of, of inflammation. And these cytokines do various things, including stimulating the bone marrow to produce more white blood cells. And they trigger the release of granulocytes from the bone marrow, as well as demargination of existing neutrophils from the endothelium. And this is why, for example, if you have a patient who you suspect as um, having sepsis, the high and on the differential count, you would note that they are uh, there's the presence of left shifts with um, immature granulocytes as well as band forms that are there. And that's because of this ongoing cytokine stimulation of the, the bone marrow to produce these granulocytes. Um, and the bone marrow in response to that produces these immature forms as well. The other thing that's important to note is that it stimulates the adrenal gland to increase catecholamines and cortisol. And this is important because these hormones increase the neutrophil um, count quite significantly, and is thought to reduce the lymphocyte count um, in sepsis. And this ratio of used as a biomarker um, uh, for sepsis. So the absolute count indicates the medulla response, and it's thought that the differential helps to evaluate which white cell population is mainly involved in the inflammatory process, and therefore may possibly allow for an etiological diagnosis. So the normal white cell count is between 3.92 to 10.4. Sepsis may cause leukopenia. So like I said, in, with, a, with that cytokine release, you may have an increase in these hormones that result in a in the initial period of um, the stimulus, or more commonly, it will cause leukocytosis. It takes time to go up, so it rises within 8 to 20 hours of infection, peaks within 24 to 48 hours, and decreases to reference range after about three days. It is, an, It was used in the SERS criteria and still is. It is cheap. It costs about 20 rand, 26 cents to do at the NHLS, and has a quick turnaround time of about 20 to 30 minutes. The problem, though, is that it needs to be carefully evaluated in patients who have HIV, on steroids, who have adrenal insufficiency, and can be raised due to physical stress, emotional stress, medications, trauma, smoking, connective tissue diseases, and malignancy. So there's a whole host of non-infectious causes that may affect the white cell count itself. And this is just to give an example that this is a table taken out of a paper that looked at the sensitivity and specificity of biomarkers in acute pyelonephritis. And the sensitivity of the white blood cell count was 81.5 with a specificity of only 42.9. Um, and this is another table taken from um, incidence of biomarkers um, in the NICU and showed that the white blood cell count sensitivity was only 59.5 with the specific of 79.6, so not great, and it varies between the studies. Um, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which I alluded to before, uh, normally is less than three. So 
within the first six hours, um, there is this increase in the cortisol and catecholamines, and this is thought to cause an increase in the neutrophils. Um, and you have this neutrophil to leukocyte ratio that may change in the setting of infection. And several studies have showed that this ratio correlates with Apache 2. And a meta-analysis done by Huang et al, which included 14 studies with over 11,500 patients, demonstrated it as a prognostic marker in sepsis patients. There aren't any universally accepted cutoff values, but a rough benchmark has been provided in this table, where if you look at the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio of more than three, there is a sensitivity of 96%, but a specificity of only 10%. And if that ratio is the, the values moved up to about 10. That sensitivity drops to about 80% and the specificity only at about 56%. So again, not ideal as a, a marker of sepsis. The ESR acute phase reactant. So in the presence of an infection or an inflammatory response, you have stimulation of the macrophages, which produce IL-6, which is one of the cytokines, which stimulates the liver and upregulates the production of these acute phase reactants. So you have amyloid, CRP, fibrinogen. And when you have high fibrinogen, as well as other acute phase reactants, which are positively charged, um, in the presence of the negatively charged red cells, it causes a higher rate at which the red cells settle in plasma. And this is measured as the distance in millimeters that the red cells descend over an hour, and that forms the basis of the ESR. So the normal ESR in females, according to the Westergren method, is less than 20 millimeters per hour, and in males, less than uh, 10 millimeters per hour. And it's an indirect acute phase reactant as it changes in response to fibrinolin levels and plasma viscosity. And like I said, it's expressed in millimeters per hour and assesses the rate of fall of suspended red cells in plasma in a vertical tube in an hour. And this is a picture to demonstrate how it's actually done in the lab. So it rises within 24 to 48 hours at the onset of information. So it rises a bit later, the stimulus, and falls back uh, quite slowly with resolution of inflammation. It's cheap. It costs about 31 grand 83 cents, and there is a quick turnaround time. However, it has poor sensitivity and specificity. So, for example, in periprosthetic joint infections, the sensitivity was 89%, but with a specificity of only 69%. The problem with this marker as well is that it's affected by various other non-infectious um, factors. So there are factors that increase the ESR itself, for example, renal failure, pregnancy, being female, anemia, and factors that decrease the ESR. So leukocytosis, low fibrinogen levels, sickle cell disease, abnormal red cells, congestive heart failure, and also technical issues in the lab may also alter the, the, the ESR levels. Um, extremely high ESR values, so more than 100 millimeters per hour, are seen with malignancy, arteritis, and TB. So the CRP, which is uh, the most commonly used biomarker, was discovered by Tillett and Francis in 1930, as it was the first substance identified in the serum of patients with acute inflammation that reacted with the C-carbohydrate antigen of the pneumococcal capsule. So it's a pentameric protein synthesized the liver and the levels rise in response to inflammation. So the inflammatory infectious process during the acute phase stimulates the release of IL-6, which upregulates genes responsible for CRP transcription. So CRP has both pro and anti-inflammatory processes. It recognizes and clears foreign pathogens and damaged cells by binding to phosphocholine, phospholipids, histone, chromatin, and fibronectin. It activates the complement pathway and phagocytic cells and prevents adhesion of neutrophils to the endothelial cells. The normal CRP milligrams per liter, and the cost is 80, essentially 82 rand. It rises within four to six hours following inflammation, peaks at about 48 to 72 hours, and the levels de decrease exponentially over the next 24 hours when the stimuli ends. Again, though, this biomarker has various other factors that affect it that are non-infectious. So low CRP values could be because of NSAID use, statins in liver failure, patients on IL-6 inhibitors, patients on magnesium supplementation, high CRPs, may be seen in patients who are on hormone replacement therapy, in female, older patients with obesity, depression, smoking, insomnia. And in these conditions in the literature, it's been shown that the levels of CRP are usually between three and 10. Um, so not, you, not found to be more than 10 in most of the studies that were looked, um, that, were, that, that 
looked at the CRP in these specific patient populations. The other thing though, is that CRP can be raised more than 10 um, milligrams per liter in the setting of inflammatory diseases. So for example, rheumatoid arthritis, angst, spond, psoriasis, systemic vasculitis, and the setting of myocardial infarction, trauma, surgery, burn, these, um, and so all of that, all of those factors that are non-infectious can cause quite a significant rise in the CRP. In one single center study, bacterial infections accounted for 88% of episodes with an extremely high CRP of more than 500. And a systematic review and meta-analysis done by Liu et al. in 2016 showed a sensitivity of 75% and a specificity of 67% of CRP in the setting of sepsis. The next biomarker is IL-6 which was discovered in 1986. So it rises earlier than the PCT and CRP, usually within one to two hours. It's a pro size from T lymphocytes, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and monocytes. And it's an important mediator in inflammation. So if you remember the first uh, image that was detailing the, the pathophysiology of sepsis, IL-6 was involved in almost activating most of the, the effector organs in this um, inflammatory cascade. The normal values are between 5 and 15. Um, we don't have IL-6 available in, in state, but in private it is available and it costs about 240 rand and has a turnaround time of about 24 hours. A systematic review and meta-analysis by Ho et al. in 2015 showed a sensitivity and specificity of 85% and 62% in adult patients with sepsis. But another systematic review and meta-analysis done in 2016, which included the above study, demonstrated a sensitivity of 73% and a specificity of 72%. So much better um, than the white cell count ESR and um, similar to the CRP. So IL-6 has been the talk of the town recently in the last two um, COVID-19. And they've been looking at the changes of IL-6 levels as a prognostic indicator in patients with COVID-19. And it's been found with the various studies that IL-6 is a reliable indicator of disease severity and prediction for ventilatory support in COVID-19. Perception is... Um, a biomarker that is relatively specific for, for bacterial infection. And the reason for that is that uh, the monocytes and macrophages um, have toll-like receptors, which are, so, which are bound to this membrane CD14. So this membrane-bound CD14 uh, molecule. And when you have the lipopolysaccharide of the bacterial cell wall, that is recognized by these receptors. Um, when it binds to the toll like receptor and the lipopolysaccharide binding protein and the CD14, this complex of CD14 plus the LPS and the LP binding protein actually detach from the toll like receptor and are re released into circulation. And in circulation, catepsin D breaks down uh, the soluble CD14 from this LPS LPB complex. And that is what is regarded as as perception. So it rises early within two hours, relatively specific for bacterial infection due to the role in pathogenesis of sepsis as it's a receptor for LPS. It has a half-life of four to eight hours. It is not freely available and is costly. So a quick Google search of the assays and the consumable used amounted to about $300 from what I could see um, with perception. And the sensitivity and specificity varied between studies. So a systematic review showed a sensitivity of 88% and a specificity of 77% in the setting of sepsis. But perception is renally excreted. Therefore, there's particular attention in evaluating levels in CKD patients. And this is particularly pronounced in patients who undergo dialysis. So in the studies that have reviewed the levels of perception in CKD and those undergoing dialysis, there's a thought about whether should be different cutoff values for perceptions in these particular patients, as opposed to patients who don't have CKD or are not undergoing dialysis. So that's one of the problems that um, perception has as a biomarker. And now PCT, which has become the poster child of biomarkers of recent years, um, is one of the most popularized um, biomarkers. It was discovered in the 1970s, and PCT was first identified as a potential biomarker in 1993 by colleagues. So PCT is a precursor of calcitonin produced by the C cells of the thyroid gland. 
the, there are non-thyroidal tissues like the spleen, kidney, adipocytes, pancreas, colon, brain, and lungs that are capable of producing procalcitonin. But the difference between the non-thyroidal tissues and thyroidal tissues is that the non-thyroidal tissues lack this processing pathway that's necessary to convert procalcitonin to calcitonin because that's usually what happens. And therefore, you have this high levels of PCT that are released into the systemic circulation. In terms of trying to find out what the actual function of PCT is in the inflammatory um, pathway, it's thought that it influences the migration of monocytes to the site of inflammation and may play a role in um, vascular contraction, but it's still not well defined in the literature. So it rises four hours following inflammation, peaks at about 12 to 24 hours um, with a half-life of about 28 to 33 hours and persists for as long as the inflammatory process is present. The problem though is cost. So it costs about 436 rand and 60 cents in state. Um, and in a systematic review done by Waka et al, it showed a pooled sensitivity of 0.77 and a specificity of 0.79. And in another retrospective cohort study, done by Joseph et al, it shows a sensitivity of 74.8% and a specificity of 63.8% for the diagnosis of sepsis. And it's also to bear in mind that it may not rise in contained local, localized infections like tonsillitis, sinusitis, cystitis, and empyema. And this table is very important, which shows the non-infectious causes of the rise in PCT, which are about the threshold that most studies have used to um, say that there is possibility of infections. And it's important to, to, to understand that there are other things that can cause the, the, the PCT to go up. For example, uh, plasmodium, so malaria itself can cause a high PCT. Severe physiological stress, burns, trauma, surgery, bowel ischemia, pancreatitis, ischemic stroke, um, immune mediated disorders like Kawasaki disease, malaria, Gallery thyroid carcinoma, lung cancers with neuroendocrine components, and other comorbidities like renal insufficiency, severe liver disease, and certain drugs like interleukin-2, almutazumab, and rituximab can also cause high um, PCT levels. And this is, this is important to bear in mind that PCT is not only raised in bacterial infections. There tends to be this uh, almost default setting that if the PCT is high, it has to be a bacterial infection. And this is to, to emphasize the point that that's not the case. And often you can have clinically well patients who have other conditions raised. Um, the other thing that, I, that isn't on this table is also in, in neonates as well, there seems to be a higher PCT in the immediate postnatal period. So all these factors need to be considered when you're assessing a patient who potentially has sepsis versus something else. So a review paper by Azini et al. reviewed the role of PCT in different clinical scenarios, and they reviewed trials and meta-analyses from 2010 and 2019. And when you look at the trials or the studies around PCT, it actually becomes quite overwhelming because they talk, they, there's, um, talk about PCT as a marker of sepsis in various clinical scenarios, so in the ICU versus primary care versus the ED. And they also looked at um, whether PCT as a guidance for, for antibiotic cessation. And so it, it, it kind of revolves around two main things from what I've gathered. And the first thing is that, can you use PCT as a marker of sepsis? And the second part is, can you use PCT as a guide to management of antibiotic duration? And so PCT as a marker of sepsis. So firstly, I've, just, I've broken it up to different systems just so that we see what the evidence is for the various systems. Um, in terms of, of its use as, as a marker of sepsis. So firstly, PCT and CNS infections. And I found this quite interesting that in a meta-analysis done in 2015, which included nine were using PCT in the diagnosis of bacterial meningitis, the pool sensitivity was 0.9 with a pool specificity of 0.98. And another meta-analysis done in 2016, which included 22 studies, showed a sensitivity of 0.95 and a specificity of 0.97. And the conclusion was that several studies have identified serum PCT together with the clinical setting as a good biomarker for identifying bacterial meningitis. But when you actually go back and you look at these various studies, the problems are that there's a lot of differences in the studies themselves. 
some didn't strictly adhere to, to protocol. And the cutoff values especially varied between the studies from 0.1 all the way up to two, making a universal cutoff quite difficult to establish. So although they, there was the presence of uh, a raised PCT in these settings, to find a universal cutoff was very difficult because the various studies had used um, different cutoffs. Um, this slide is pretty much displaying the controversies with PCT in certain conditions. So PCT in infectious complications of polytrauma. So trauma provokes quite a strong mass clinical symptoms associated with sepsis. And um, Arawaki showed that a peak level is achieved at day one if you measure the PCT following trauma, and then to a lesser extent on day two. But the studies have showed very mixed results. So some show that a higher PCT value is associated with multi-organ dysfunction, and others have shown that with sepsis, there's a significantly higher peak PCT value. Um, but again, the cutoff values varied greatly among these studies. PCT in infectious complications of burns. So in a review by um, Grinogur, all burns, more than 15 to 20% of total body surface area, have served for months after the wounds are closed. Therefore, baseline burn patients always have the signs used to diagnose sepsis in the general population. And again, a meta-analysis by man showed varying cutoff levels of PCT, and therefore it remains quite controversial about whether you can use PCT as a marker of infection in burns patients. Another one that is quite controversial and topical is the use of PCT in infectious complications of pancreatitis. And some studies have shown usefulness and others have not. And this is an example where a systematic review done in 2009 by Mofidi showed a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 90% which looks so impressive. But then another study done by um, Komalafi showed a sensitivity of only 75% and a specificity of 57% at a value of 0.95. So the vast majority of studies with PCT have been done with respiratory conditions. And um, this is a nice summary from up to date where the use of PCT in various clinical um, scenarios associated with respiratory conditions have been evaluated. So the use of, um, of PCT in an outpatient, outpatient setting for uh, community-acquired pneumonia actually varied amongst experts. So some people have proposed that if you have access to PCT, it's cheap and you get the results easily, then it may be worthwhile doing it because it will reduce the um, of antibiotics in, in the setting. Um, but the data for OPD patients is very limited. There were about two trials that looked at the, um, with, with small patient numbers that looked at the, um, the role of PCT in community acquired pneumonia patients who are treated as outpatients. And it it, what it could show was that there seemed to be a reduction in antibiotic exposure in those patients who use, or in, in that patient cohort where PCT was used um, as, as a biomarker. So most studies have agreed to begin antimicrobial treatment in the following categories for respiratory tract infections when the PCT values are like this. So with a PCT value of zero, less than 0 0.1, it's strongly discouraged. If it's less than 0.25, it's discouraged. More than 0.25, it's encouraged. If it's more than 0.5, it's strongly encouraged. The, for ventilator-associated pneumonias, the 2016 IDSA guidelines recommend clinical criteria rather than PCT and clinical criteria to decide when to initiate antibiotics. And this is quite an important um, because a lot of the studies that are looking at um, the usefulness of PCT as a biomarker in sepsis have emphasized that your clinical criteria, your clinical acumen is extremely important in deciding first and foremost, whether you want to initiate or withhold antibiotics. And this is even if the PCT value is normal in that setting. Um, so the, the PCT should not be used as the sole determinant on whether you want to give antibiotics or not in a patient who you think may have sepsis. Um, in COPD patients, a study by me et al. demonstrated moderate ability to identify bacterial respiratory infections in acute exacerbations of COPD. And they small sample sizes and the, the limitations in terms of the methods that the trials were done under. And it's also noted that the spectrum of pathogens are different and infection is not as invasive as in CAP. In acute bronchitis, it has not been evaluated in patients because most cases are caused by viruses and routine use is not recommended. In COVID, 
um, just like in COPD patients, there may be moderate evidence for using PCT um, because PCT infection, uh, PCT values in the setting of viral infections tend to be low. And the reason for this is that viral increase your tumor necrosis factor alpha and your interferon gamma, which tends to downregulate PCT production. So in the setting, for example, with a COVID patient who you're not sure has just COVID or COVID plus a bacterial pneumonia, the PCT value is helpful in that setting because if it's low, um, it's, it, it, it's been a, so we can safely assume that it's just COVID, but if it's high, there may be the possibility of an associated superimposed bacterial infection. And the same for COPD patients where um, most of the exacerbations may be triggered by viruses, in which case the PCT values are low. Um, whereas if it was a bacterial um, pathogen, then the PCT levels may be high. And so PCT has been used in those subsets of patients to decide on antibiotic initiation. So PCT in critically ill patients, so a systematic review, again, looking at 30 observational studies with over 3,000 patients, showed a 0.77 and a specificity of 0.79. And another retrospective study showed a sensitivity of 74.3 and a specificity of 63.8 for the diagnosis of sepsis in critically ill. And the systemic sepsis cutoff values that are used now, so this is different from the values that are used for the respiratory infections. Um, uh, a little bit higher, so 0.5, uh, it was unlikely. Between 0.5 and 2, it's possible systemic sepsis. Between 2 and 10 suggests systemic infection, and more than 10 indicates severe bacterial infection. So how about PCT as a marker to discontinue antibiotic therapy? By Schutz et al, comparing PCT-guided algorithm with standard care in 6,000 patients with low respiratory tract infections of any kind and across various settings, including the ED and ICU, showed there was a reduction in antibiotic use with no increase in adverse outcomes in the PCT group. The IDSA and ATS um, groups also suggest that a low PCT can guide early discontinuation of antibiotics in a patient who is clinically stable, has no evidence of bacterial infection, and has a positive influenza test, and this is in the setting of a pneumonia. So I've put this here, and this is from the IDSA, which um, and it's it maybe a bit small to read, but I just want to point out that they also have addressed the problems with um, the evidence with regards to uh, PCT as a marker to discontinue antibiotic therapy. Um, there have been problems related to enrolling the patients in the studies, um, the diagnosis of certain of, of the patients. Um, when patients were withdrawn, there was no reasons given, and there was no uh, blinding to the outcome assessor. And so a lot of these um, problems may have caused uh, a, a serious risk of bias. And also levels, which would make some results look more favorable. Um, and so one needs to bear in mind that all these studies have, have these problems. And so we should be looking at it in context and not taking it as just the summary that is presented to us. A cut of value of less than 0.5 or an 80% drop from peak level suggests a response to antibiotics. And it's also emphasized that it's not a requirement. If the patient is clinic, you feel your clinical judgment is that there is a sufficient response um, uh, with a clinically resolved pneumonia, that's enough to stop antibiotics in those patients. And these cutoffs are mainly derived from antibiotics on guidance of PCT study, which assessed over 1,500 patients in the ICU with suspected or known infection, and about 65% of these patients had respiratory tract infections. And compared with protocol, the PCT group had lower median antibiotic exposure by about two days and lower 28-day mortality. But there are also problems with this trial as well. 30% of these patients were discharged from ICU before the algorithm was done, and physicians often did not adhere to stopping antibiotics at these prescribed levels, and they excluded and um, the assessors were not blinded to, to the, the groups. So this is just a summary of the sepsis biomarkers by, in a paper done um, by Dr. Lepi. And it's just to look at the various biomarkers with the number of meta-analyses and the range of sensitivity and specificities. And we can see here, PCT has had 10 meta-analyses, sensitivity ranges from, from 0.71 to 1, specificity 0.61 to 0.88, CRP, um, three meta-analyses, 
sensitivity between 0.75 and 0.91, and specificity between 0.36 and 0.67. And Perception had six meta-analyses and uh, relatively good sensitivities and specificities. But even though this looks great just looking at this table, one has to bear in mind the factors that we've spoken about, the clinical context, associated comorbidities, organ dysfunction, any other medications, um, and how these studies were done. And so although it looks great when we're looking at the table, um, one needs to bear in mind that there are a whole host of other factors that we need to consider um, when we're interpreting these values. Um, biomarkers that are in progress now, so non-coding RNA transcripts called microRNAs have promising diagnostic potential, and they're measured by next generation sequencing. So this has already been started in the oncology field for early diagnosis of malignancy. So these microRNAs are released in response to pathogens. And they may be the first, um, they're involved in the innate immune response and they also play a direct role in, um, in attack against these pathogens. And so the principle is that detection of these microRNAs, even before you actually detect the pathogen itself, um, is a promising field because then you can you catch the, the infection in the incubation period and not in the normal or clinical illness. So you tend to catch them early. And um, the benefit is that they stay on a wide range of bodily fluids. They have already been identified in the studies ongoing for microRNAs and HIV, TB, Hendra viruses, malaria, and Ebola. But you can imagine the co costs associated with next generation sequencing um, could be quite a lot. The other things that have been looked into are gut permeability factors. So zonulin, intestinal fatty acid binding protein, citrulin, which are being investigated in critically ill septic. That the critically ill patients show an increase in gut permeability, which may trigger, trigger multi-organ dysfunction. And so these factors are also being looked at as potential um, future biomarkers. And then uh, lastly is molecular diagnostics by nucleic acid extraction and amplification with sequencing. And this is where they take whole blood, they sequence everything in the blood. Um, if they detect something, they do extraction and ampli amplification with sequencing. And there are various um, machines in which they've, they've tried this on, and you can actually get results within six hours. Looks very promising, but studies still need to be done to um, decide with whether this is something that can be sustainable and is cost effective everywhere. So my last two slides are on biomarkers in viral infections. Um, so a few biomarkers are being investigated. So far, we've spoken about a lot of the biomarkers that are involved in bacterial sepsis. So um, with viral infections, there are a few biomarkers that are investigated, mainly in the form of tuber necrosis factor-related apoptosis, ligand, myoxovirus resistance, which have been shown to be activated in several viral infections. But these are all still under investigation in the pediatric population. And then my last slide is just on biomarkers in fungal infections. So the two big uh, biomarkers that we use is the beta-D-glucan and galatamanin. And so this is a nice summary table from the ID Society website, which um, looks at the sensitivity and specificity of beta-D-glucan and galactomannan. So beta-D-glucan is a polysaccharide cell wall component of many fungi. Its routine use is in candida and aspergillus, but it's also found to be positive in PJP, histoplasma, fusarium. It's negative in cryptococcus and mucoralis. There is a sensitivity of about 55 to 96% and a specificity of 77 to 96%. And there's higher specificity for invasive fungal infections in, hematologically, uh, in hematological malignancy patients. There are also a whole host of things that can cause false positives. So IVIG, albumin, other blood products, IV penicillin formulations, hemodialysis with cellulose membranes, um, cellulose faults with IV administration, gauze penicillin, even nocardia has been noted to be a cause of a false positive beta D. Galactomannan, which is a major polysaccharide constituent of the aspergillus cell wall. Its routine use is for aspergillus, but has also been found to be positive with fusarium, histoplasma, asomyce, cryptococcus, uh, but negative with mucoralis, has a sensitivity and specificity of 80% for invasive aspergillosis, and is mostly useful in high-risk patients with hematological malignancy or with uh, stem cell transport. Again, lots of things that can cause a false 
as augmented IVIG blood products, um, use of plasma light for bowel solutions, causing positive bowel uh, galactomannans, contamination of food with aspergillus, and frozen ice pots in the setting of graft versus host disease. So the conclusion is that there, there is no ideal biomarker, unfortunately, and most biomarkers are affected by a whole host of non-infectious factors, and therefore consideration should be given to the availability, the cost, reproducibility, sensitivity, and specificity of the specific marker used in the clinical setting. The clinical picture combined with imaging and laboratory should be used together to identify a separate clinical picture should never ever be forgotten in these patients. And this is re-emphasized in a lot of the trials as well as the, the formal guidelines from the IDSA and the ATS that your clinical picture should be the driving force um, and not the biomarker itself. Um, thank you. Thanks, Sharon. That's, oh, sorry, let me turn off there. Um, th that's, that's really great. Sorry, I actually forgot to put the CPD link point. So let me do that while we talk for the rest. Um, CPD points coming. All right. In the chat, there we are. Um, so where would you use it currently? Any of them? Which, which of them do you think is worth ordering ever really? And, and, and when would you do them personally? So I think with regards to um, the biomarkers, for me, I think the CRP, um, because it, I think in relation to the PCT, it gives you more or less the same amount of information. Um, and I'll just go back to the slide, sorry, where it just shows the sensitivity and specificity ranges. So I think the CRP is a very helpful biomarker. Um, and where I would use the PCT, and uh, like I was saying, in, in respiratory tract infections where you're not sure whether the primary etiology is viral or bacterial, the PCT um, is valuable in that setting. So I think that um, to, to help you differentiate between a bacterial viral etiology in that setting in pneumonia, I would probably use the PCT, but for everything else, I would probably use the CRP. Um, I think especially because of the cost difference, 82 Rand versus 430 Rand, and it tells you the same, um, you know, I know PCT has been advocated more because of early diagnosis. It has been shown in some studies to correlate with the extent and severity of micro, um, the bacterial load that people have tended to go towards PCT. But I think looking at all the trials and looking at the pros and cons in the various clinical settings, I personally would probably use PCT with pneumonia and, for example, in COVID or in COPD. Um, but I think for everything else, I'd probably just use the CRP. Yeah, sure. I think that's that's helpful. So, I mean, I think one key thing that, you know, people always misunderstand the PCT interpretation as being indicative of a bacterial infection. And that's totally, I mean, that's rubbish. It's it's backwards. All really PCT, if it's raised, tells you is it's not a virus. It doesn't tell you it's mm -hmm. bacterial. I mean, as you, you showed that lovely list of everything, any type of shock, pancreatitis, burns, anything will raise your PCT pretty much. But it's pretty useful because with a partial exception of COVID, I mean, there is, it has even been called into question with COVID because uh, PCTs do rise in severe COVID, actually, even without bacterial secondary infection. But, you know, with that exception, it, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't um, seem to rise. So I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's real. I mean, the, in sort of guidelines appropriate use, if you look at people who are really being sober about the evidence, it really only made a dent in respiratory illnesses and specifically pneumonias and COPDs. Um, in terms of guidance, and even then, in those guidelines, as I say, it was kind of an optional, uh, and you know, yeah. not required. It's hard. You look elsewhere for guidance about PCT in a, in a kind of, um, you know, in other settings, and they really just don't shape up. And as you yeah. said, it's an expensive test. Um, yeah. And it's, I think it's got a brilliant branding, a brilliant marketing department. Yeah, that it's, definitely. It's kind of been sold to for every and all. And if you look at the stats, I mean, as you rightly said, and you've done a really great job of showing the sensitivity and specificity through these things. It's really not good enough. I mean, if you look at any of these things, remember, you know, you're deciding about antibiotics here. You know, you you to miss an infection on the basis of of PCT or CRP would be you know, terrible. And if you look, the sensitivities yeah. only in the 70s, 80s, and most of these trials. Yeah. Um, which is really not not good enough. You know, you wouldn't yeah. want to rely on it. And so it's it's a it's a really tricky thing. I mean, and I think you know there is a there is a reason why this may be the case, and it it really goes down you know to sort of evolutionary principles of the. The bugs always out evolve the body, um, and yeah. so 
the body when it gets a new infection it's very difficult for it to know it can't load up every possible pathogen you know and just wait for one of them to hit it, it doesn't know what the new thing has evolved or new antigens evolved or new bugs evolved or anything like that so it overreacts and it yes. shoots off you know it's very it's like a fire fire alarm you know it's much more important for it to go off when there's a fire than than even if it means it's going off when there's lots when there isn't a fire um yeah and that's a problem with all the biomarkers you know they they when they're up they don't tend to mean a huge amount a huge amount in other words they're not very specific at all when they're negative they can be very useful you know negative crp is useful to rule out certain things and a negative pct is useful to rule out certain things positive one yeah. that's is pretty tricky to interpret apart yeah. from pneumonia when you do at least can lim you can limit it to bacterial versus viral in most cases unlike most yeah it's tough though um esr so it was quite difficult because the ESR, I kept trying to look for studies on um, the sensitivity and specificities with ESR. And again, um, the problem is that the sensitivity and specificities are quite poor and they range 60 to 70%, so not great. And because there's so many other variables, aside from non-infectious causes, but just in general, the laboratory technique and how it's done and uh, uh, how it's processed in the lab and things, biomarker um even with the um uh with sorry with with extremely high crp uh, sorry esr values where i said it, it's most notable in malignancies and um arthritis as well as certain infections like tb it really has has yeah it's it's not it's not great so it 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 doesn't outperform any of the other other biomarkers and tends to be skewed by a lot of other things that are non-infectious. Yeah, and in, in this country, uniquely terrible because of HIV. Yeah, because of, HIV. yeah, exactly, yeah. So, it, you know, where, where ESR is universally raised pretty much in, in HIV, given the polyclonal, uh, clon, uh, clonal rather, gammopathy. Uh, it's I, I like Gary Martinson's comment on it. It's a, it's a test from the 1800s and it should stay there. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <answer. laughs> um, that's yeah that's that's good. all right so i'm just going through some of the uh comments would you escalate antibiotics in a patient with a rising crp but a flat pct hospitalized patients with a pneumonia say no i wouldn't and i think that's also where the importance of an various biomarkers is important so like we said for example like the pct tends to rise quite early, where CRP takes a while. So when you've seen the patient, you may have just caught the patient, you know, as that CRP was going up. Um, and if they're clinically getting better, you should, um, you know, the recommendation is that, well, in the case of PCT, but also I, I would extrapolate for CRP is that you watch the trend. And if, if the patient is clinically better and um, it takes some time to come down, remember it takes about 24 to about 36 hours for that CRP to come down back to baseline. And so I wouldn't, if the patient is well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't escalate antibiotics just based on the number, because again, we don't know where on that curve, you know, the patient falls just purely of CRP. So I, I wouldn't necessarily um, escalate antibiotics if the patient is otherwise well. And I think that's the important thing that a lot of these studies have shown is that um, there seems to be this problem with trying to treat the number and not the patient. And so because the, 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 the biomarkers are not coming down the way that we want, we start panicking. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, Jamie, if I can give an example of a patient that I had seen um, where this patient was like this clinically well, was admitted for an elective workup and the admitting team for whatever reason did a CRP and a PCT and both were high. And what happened is that this it went into a cycle of culturing, giving antibiotics, culturing, escalating antibiotics, because this PT or the CR and this patient was otherwise clinically well. And when we went to see this patient, it actually came out that this patient was being investigated for a neuroendocrine tumor of the lung, which is a known cause of a high PCT. So in, I think we have to look at one, the biokinetics of the marker, look at how the patient is clinically and not try and chase a number, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that, as you rightly said, it's a, it's a very common, common scenario of these raised markers. And like we said, I think, and that's why it's really important to emphasize, and then these flat markers may be useful, um, but again, not, not anywhere close to perfectly. Um, 
you know, if you look at the sensitivity there, many of them are in the 70s, 80s, which means you're going to miss a bunch of infections, even so if they're negative, it doesn't rule yeah. it out either, especially when you come to localized or loculated infections. Um, so that's that's an important exactly. point. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then, as you say, you know, in addition, uh, you know, the positives ones tend to lose all specificity pretty quickly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, rightly so. So, no, I, I don't like escalating. I mean, I, I, I won't deny that sometimes it's a trigger to at least think twice. So, for example, if yeah. I have a patient come in, um, you know, who with with a pyelonephritis and let's say someone did a CRP and it's 300 and after, you know, four days, someone repeats it and it's 400. That does make me think twice. I mean, I mean, I'm not. I don't rule it out or totally ignore it. But it's, um, as you say, when you look at all the other potential causes, it certainly shouldn't imply to you that it's an infection until proven otherwise. Um, the the value of PCT and heme malignancies is a question in the chat. So that's interesting. So CRP, um, if you go through it, has been known raised um, in malignancies amongst them being hematological malignancies but sorry Sharon you, you broke up there um, for a second. Actually, can you can you just repeat that sorry I sorry Jamie can you hear me yeah got you just yeah. yes sorry, you broke up for a second sorry um, so CRP has been shown to be increased in the setting of malignancies including hematological malignancies but um, PCT has actually been shown not to be impaired um, in in some of the hematological malignancies so there may be a place for the um, use of PCT in hemolytic not a lot of studies um, that have been done, uh, particularly with the subgroup of patients. And also to note that a lot of these trials, again, had excluded um, patients who had immunosuppressive conditions. So it's actually difficult to tell the true value of PCT um, in specifically in heme malignancies. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it depends which heme malignancy, I think, as well. You know, the lymphomas don't tend to raise it. Um, but leukemias, especially once you start becoming neutropenic, often do. And it's not the leukemia, it's the gut translocations that occur. So, you know, so if you post chemotherapy, for example, the PCT is just not that useful. Um, it's, a, it's a nightmare. I mean, I wish it were. I wish it were easy to do, but it, it isn't. Um, uh, looking through there, is there a role for candida antibody testing? Oh, I'll be honest, I, I didn't come across that. So I'm, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't think a well-validated one, no. It's not in any of the sort of big candidemia guidelines and that. I, you do struggle as well with antibodies always and that, it, you know, there's obviously a half-life on them, but it, it can be very tricky to know when, depending on which antibody you look at, um, how long ago that it was formed, you know, if you're looking at, say, IgG um, versus IgA or something like that. So I think it's, it's tricky. I think it's done in advance of the evidence in, in most settings, as far as I'm aware. Um, and then just looking there, did you come across anything about pancreatic stone protein? Uh, I did not. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure. I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid I must plead ignorance as well. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. Sorry. I, I think it's. I think we can at least say it's not a prime time marker, but I, I don't know. Sure. Okay, great. So we're at four o'clock. So thank you very much. I'm going to just stop the recording.